Hi, and welcome to Thursday Comics. I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. I am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee, and Jack Kirby's Star Warriors, The Adventures of Adam Starr and the Solar Legion. I'm also the author of Witchman, a new superhero comic book, which recently had a successful Kickstarter campaign. The Mighty Thor, number 141. Who is Replicus? We got a nice little montage cover here with little highlights from the issue and a, a close-up shot of Thor. The Wrath of Replicus, featuring the murderous menace of mob leader Slugger Sykes. A dazzling Jack Kirby and Stan Lee drama in depth, inked by Vince Coletta, lettered by Artie Simic. I've been waiting a long time to do this. So uh, this guy's punching out Thor while this guy's operating the machinery. This villainous pair, it looks a little bit like Jack amped up and cartooned himself and cartooned Stan Lee and made them into this villainous duo in here. And I wonder about that. This this uh, cigar chomping uh, guy, uh, you know, sort of dressed like Kirby would have dressed back then, throwing a punch. And then this skinny bald guy in the background, he, he knocks him out. And it turns out this is one of those Jack Kirby fake out uh, introductions where the Thor that they're fighting turns out to be a robot designed by this guy. This is Slugger Sykes. This is Chuda who is the inventor who is uh, gonna sell Slugger Sykes these robots that he designs, and he's showing him his, his ultimate robot, Replicus. Another cool looking robot. This is the second of two Robot of the Month stories in a row. Both fine looking robots from the Jack Kirby Design Factory that produced the Cree Sentry. A really nice looking robot, but again, underwhelming. Uh, in story terms compared to what we'd seen, you know, for like the past year or two on this book. And Dr. Don Blake, he's still a doctor and he pays a house call in, a, you know, what looks like the tenement where Jack Kirby grew up. A sort of old timey golden age comic kind of setup. He visits Granny Gardenia, nicknamed that because uh, she sells flowers on the street. Again, this sort of, you know, cracked environment, probably probably not too different from the conditions in which Jack Kirby grew up. Pays a visit to this woman who's who's sick and, you know, Don Blake uh, sort of pulling his weight in a way that he hasn't in a while, you know, actually, actually being, you know, like a driving force in the story. And he pays Granny Gardenia a visit and so do these two mobsters who work for Slugger Sykes. They have to make sure they get a flower from her because Slugger Sykes is superstitious and he always buys a flower from Granny Gardenia every day and now that she's sick and isn't selling her flowers on the street, he's afraid if he doesn't have one of her flowers today, something bad will happen to him. And and so these guys bully Don Blake and, and tell Don Blake that uh, this guy's so skinny he could use a sawbones himself, which doesn't quite apply anymore. I mean, uh, uh, back in Thor number one, Jack was drawing a little differently and his skinny characters were very skinny. Dr. Blake was was like a very skinny character. Now he's he's filled out a little more the same way all of Jack Kirby's characters have filled out as the 60s progressed. So that joke doesn't quite land the way it might have. There's a news report on the TV about this robot replicas flying through the city, chased by the cops, robbing banks, and uh, it's interesting. It looks like we're getting sort of live footage of with all this action and stuff, it's kind of exciting. And for some reason in the in the dialogue, it says that these startling photos were taken by a part-time photographer named Parker who happened to be at the window of the Daily Bugle building when the silent monster struck. So the previous issue and this issue and also the next issue are kind of like a return to form, a, a, in some ways a retreat back to like the formula of early Marvel, you know, with cameos from, from characters from other comics. So having that be a photo taken by P Peter Parker sort of ties it into the larger Marvel universe. Uh, even though I think this would play better if we were actually watching, you know, footage of, of Replicus. And so Replicus comes back, opens up his chest. It's filled with green dollar bills, the same green that he's made out of and the green, green that he would represent. And Slugger Sykes, who doesn't quite look like Jack Kirby anymore here. He looks a little more like Edward G. Robinson. Uh, he's really liking the way this new robot's a real earner. And uh, now that he has Replicus, he fires these two guys. These guys don't, don't like that idea. And then uh, Replicus lifts them up 
and shows them the door. So now we get a montage of Replicus's crime wave, stealing the crown jewels, breaking into a burglar-proof vault. Uh, the police need the heavy artillery to stop him. And Don Blake's in his uh, lonely doctor's office uh, reading about all of this in the newspaper. This looks like a job for Thor. He springs into action. And now, again, like the previous issue, the story is a little light, a little bit uninspired, a little bit run-of-the-mill, but... Bill Watterson talked about this in one of his books. When it's like one of those days where he doesn't really have like a great idea for like the concept of the comic strip he's doing. Maybe the script isn't so great that day. He makes sure to go all in on the artwork. And I think Jack's the same way. When the material he's working with is not as inspired, not as great as, as it could be, he goes way, way, way deep with the visuals. And so we get just a really intense, wonderful fight scene between these two. Just just a really great back and forth, some cool weapons employed. You know, these uh, stretchy fingers come out, which we saw on the cover, and, and get Thor all tangled up. And then we get these these police armed with this uh, new weaponry and this this new armor. And again, looking like something out of New Gods and, and kind of like, okay, Jack's holding back on sort of the cosmic but he can't help himself. He's still finding a way to, to come in there. I mean, these guys look like they came out of the troll war. This is a theme we'll see, you know, more, more explicitly played with in New Gods of sort of like these police forces upgrading their technology to deal with these cosmic super beings. And Slugger Sykes is watching the whole thing on his view screen, loving it. Chuda, the, the scientist who created all this stuff for him, he says that he's actually gonna sell similar technology to gangsters all over the world. And that, as it turns out, he's not just sort of a profiteer like Slugger Sykes. He's actually looking to undermine America by having all these robots rampaging and he's gonna use, you know, organized crime figures to disperse it. Again, not too different from the new gods. And um, Slugger Sykes assumes that this guy is a communist agent and he fights him, but we find out he's not a communist agent. He's actually an extraterrestrial. He's from another world looking to soften up Earth for conquest. Not too different thematically from what we see in New Gods. And Slugger Sykes decides to sacrifice his life in a last heroic moment to, to stop this. I never did a square thing in my whole crummy life, Chuda. But I figure this is my lucky day, because I'm getting a chance to make up for it, and this time I ain't gonna drop the ball. And, and kaboom, that's that. So one of those sort of, you know, sentimental stories you'd see in Marvel, particularly like early Marvel, where a villain has, has a change of heart or, or is inspired by his own, you know, innate sense of goodness, decency or patriotism or whatever, and, and sacrifices himself uh, for the greater good. And with Chuda, dead and the control mechanisms that drive replicas destroyed he is uh just you know so much useless metal and plastic thor goes back as don blake to pay a visit to granny gardenia and she's feeling a little bit better health wise she's not in bed anymore she's sitting up in her chair but um she's pretty sad because she read the news about slugger sykes he was more than just a customer to you wasn't he no don't answer that just listen to what I say. Fate moves in mysterious ways, and in the case of Slugger Sykes, something tells me that when the end came, he proved there can be more good in a man than anyone suspects. I hope his mother will remember that always. It doesn't explicitly say it, but heavily implies that Granny Gardenia is in fact Slugger Sykes' mother. A little surprise twist. The twists and turns in this are do harken back to sort of more classical short storytelling and melodramatic storytelling. And and again, it's a nice ingredient. It's it's something that's been missing, something uh, you know, cut from sort of an older formula and, and maybe more more classic to Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, more like uh, you know, maybe the kind of comics they were doing, the, the non-superhero comics they were doing. A nice little yarn. Nothing earth shattering, but still better than anything you're gonna find anywhere else in comics at this period. Next issue, a surprise guest star. I won't spoil the surprise. Tales of Asgard, still going on all cylinders. 
the Warriors three have breached the walls of Xanadu and are tearing it up there. There's flames in the background. Everybody's running for cover. Beautiful. All, all the costumes, the bits of statuary, the architectural uh, flourishes, just amazing stuff. They're going through. Volstag gets distracted by a beautiful damsel. You know, any excuse to get out of harm's way. Thor, Fandral, and Hogan are engaged in intense battle. Again, the battle continues, great stuff. We, we see a scene with Mogul and we're introduced to a new character, a thief named Ali Bar. Mogul is deciding what to do with Ali Bar and he's got an idea. He's going to make Ali Bar into his standard bearer, into his champion, into the leader of his cavalry. Gives him this, this, you know, sort of makeover. Again, just a really cool costume. Sends him out on one of those patented Jack Kirby super horses. Goes into battle carrying the battle standard of Hogan. This is really going to piss Hogan off and make this guy his unwitting target. And Mogul loves the irony. And, and we get to see his face revealed for the first time as he pulls down his mask. The irony that... He is sending Ali Bar into his death. He's sending him carrying the standard of Hogan, which is going to make him a target for Hogan and the Warriors Three. And he's having him ostensibly lead this cavalry of demons, this these uh, you know horsemen of the apocalypse. And leading is kind of a deceptive word because it's basically these these guys are are going to destroy anything in their path. And who's right in front of them? He is. So he's going to have to ride for his life in order to not get destroyed by this demon cavalry of death. We got the, the sort of, you know, glorious Jack Kirby super horse next to these uh, demonic desiccated monster horses, just to be continued. Really great setup. This, this is the final story arc for Tales of Asgard, and it's a pretty great one. It's, it's an epic for sure. I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. I am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee, and Jack Kirby's Star Warriors, The Adventures of Adam Star and the Solar Legion. I'm also the author of Witchman, a new superhero comic book which recently had a successful Kickstarter campaign. I'll see you next Thursday.